Today we're going over some of the new additions that I've made for my kit, including this awesome new leather water bottle. Stay tuned. Greetings, adventurers. I hope that you are all doing well. I've been keeping very busy during my weeks in between uh, now the running Renaissance Fair with various different crafts. And I have amassed a number of them large enough that I figured I'd share some of my new additions to my kit with you today. So one, one of these things, the first thing I want to talk about is uh, my sax knife. Just because in my last video there was lots of discussion in the comments about why it would be that sax knives are worn blade up, and I don't have a concrete answer, but I do have my anecdotal experience, so I figured I would clarify uh, why I believe this to be done. But the other things that I've made today are all born out of necessity, and I really enjoy the ability to go out, experiment with something, realize, oh, this would be a really neat thing to have to add to my kit um, to become more efficient, and then just have the ability and the freedom to just make the thing for myself. So let's get right into it. Go ahead and talk about the sax knife here. So this was the first leather working project that I ever embarked upon. I started it way before I started the channel, so I have no video footage of it. So as you can see, when you draw the sax knife, the blade is, is facing up. And someone did mention that you could easily draw it similar to how the samurai draw it by just rotating your wrist and then drawing it so the blade is facing your opponent. You can absolutely do that. Um, in fact, I would argue that you should probably figure out how to do both because situations might be different, you, you, you should just figure out how to do both. So I had a very limited amount of leather when I was making this. So it consists of the main fold over scabbard and then it has the welt in the center to keep you from cutting your own stitching and then it actually has the belt loops acting as part of the welt as well. So it's all sewn into the same fold over seam here on the top and it was a very efficient way to use the very small amount of t material that I had available to me. And so what I realized while I was working on this was, you know, you could have the blade facing down. We know that's not historically uh, accurate per se for sax knives. And you could, you could have the welt and it would be the same. The problem then becomes that you need to have the belt loops somehow attach up here on the fold over piece or sewn in on the sides and it, and it just becomes a lot more complicated than it needs to be. It, it really is just a case of it's simpler to just be able to use the same line of stitching to attach your belt loops at the same time and to have all of the work that you're doing on the scabbard be on the same side of the scabbard rather than doing the scabbard itself and then having to attach the belt loops separately somehow up here and then you have to deal with the scabbard being uh, widened by the belt loops being sewn into the sides rather than the seam so that it hangs properly. It, it just makes the most sense to do it this way. Um, and that's why I did it this way. So I assume that's also why other people did it that way. So pr pretty simple um, explanation for why sax knives were worn blade up right there. It's really the only way to do it if you're trying to conserve materials and time. Moving on, the next thing I have made is this little uh, belt pouch specifically to keep my whetstone in. It was wet, wet formed specifically for my whetstone. I got the inspiration for this by rewatching the appendices for Lord of the Rings, and I saw that uh, Viggo Mortensen had requested that Aragorn have one of these because he thought it would be more realistic. He thought Aragorn needed a whetstone. I saw that he had one and thought, oh, I would like one. Aragorn had one, I will have one. Uh, so I made one. Um, the interesting thing about this is that I used it as a learning opportunity to figure out how best to wet form and cut things and then stitch them so that they look even. And you can see on this one that it's actually very uh, warped and the edge lines here are, are not smooth at all and, there, and there's a good bit of, of separation between the two pieces of leather. And we will see in my next example that I immediately figured out what I did wrong and how to mitigate it. Um, and hindsight's 2020. I, I really should have done it the right way from the start. It would have been really easy. But, you know, you live and learn. I like the sound that that makes when it clicks in. It's got some, it's got good retention there. So this was, so this was mostly a costume piece with a little bit of practicality, but mostly a learning experience for bigger projects. So it's really nice to have just a little, a little thing like this to work on so you're not wasting too much material, and you're not wasting too much time. So we'll move on here. 
and you can immediately see the difference here. I made this immediately after I made the belt pouch. I dyed them at the same time. Um, and this is a utensils pouch for me to keep my uh, spoon and fork in. If you saw one of my previous videos here where I went on my medieval camping trip, I didn't have this yet, um, and I had these stored in a much smaller, softer leather bag, and my fear was that these sharp metal prongs were going to poke through the bag at some point, and then the bag would be useless, and it wasn't meant to carry utensils anyway, so I thought to myself, hey, I have, the, I have the technology, I have the wherewithal and the intelligence to make myself a utensils pouch, and so I did. Um, it doesn't have a belt uh, loop on the back or anything, because this is meant to just shove into my pack. I did mess up the measurements with this particular one, so it's actually not quite long enough to completely cover uh, the spoon and fork, so I actually think I'm going to take this one and use it as a pen and pencil case, and then I'm going to make a brand new one for the spoon and fork that will fit it properly. Um, but you can see here on the, on the edges, they're much cleaner and they fit together much nicer. And that is because for the whetstone, I cut everything to the shape that I wanted and then tried to wet form and stitch it, which resulted in the warping. So for this one, I cut everything larger than I wanted it, then glued everything together after I wet formed it, and then cut both pieces together so that they were entirely symmetrical, and then I did my edges. So that's why it looks so much nicer. And my most recent thing, which you may have seen if you follow me on Instagram, all of these projects are on Instagram, in fact, all of the projects that I do will probably hit Instagram first, um, and depending on what they are, they might not even be on YouTube. So if you if you want to see all of this stuff before it gets out, even if it even gets out at all on YouTube, make sure you're following me on Instagram. So this is a glass bottle that I have covered um, in leather, and you might wonder why 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 though? And the answer for that is quite simple. For my costume for Robin Hood. I want to have a cup with me because when you're walking around in 80 degree weather wearing all sorts of linen, wool, uh, and leather layers, staying hydrated is very important and the cups I have do not lend themselves well to being worn on my costume. Uh, the ceramic ones, I'd be too afraid of breaking if you're just hanging them on your belt. I have a metal one, I wouldn't be afraid of that breaking, but it's got a lid on it and I don't want that bouncing and making all sorts of noise. Not just for the fair, but just in general, I wouldn't want to carry that one with me because, you know, rangers, you're trying to be stealthy, you don't want metal banging against metal if you can help it to just announce that you're on your way. And the one leather cup, this was originally what I was going to use and it sustained a fair bit of damage from bumping up against the rest of my gear, especially my sword, and I didn't want that to happen because I like this cup and I didn't want it to get damaged. One of my castmates has uh, a leather bottle similar to this, although hers, I believe, is probably vintage, and it's one of those um, like Italian leather-covered alcohol bottles, and I looked at that and I really liked it, and I thought, I. I could, prob I could probably make something like that, um, and then I don't have to worry about damaging anything that I paid a lot of money for and that is, you know, precious to me because I, you know, I, I made this. I can easily make another one now. This one, this was actually quite a learning process for me um, because making a template for this sort of shape is very difficult, and I did not plan for it to turn out the way that it turned out. I thought all of these pieces were going to fit on it perfectly symmetrically, and they didn't. And I almost gave up, but I'm very glad that I didn't because it actually looks really good this way and so the way I circumvented my issue of the pieces not properly fitting the, th the way I thought they were and I had a very limited amount of time because I wanted to finish this bottle um, in just a couple of days so that I had it in time for the fair so I used a combination of isopropyl alcohol with my water when I was wet forming this so that it would dry a lot quicker you gotta be careful with that because you don't want the leather to dry out I didn't run into that problem um, and I was able to stretch the leather into the shape that it now is and then stitch together. And it was an absolute miracle that all of my uh, stitch grooves and holes lined up properly. So generally when you're, when you're punching stitch holes, you line both the pieces of leather up together and then punch all the holes at once so that you know that they fit. Because this is, was such an odd shape and I wet formed it before uh, I punched the holes, I had to punch everything separately and just count the number of holes and it worked perfectly and, and everything sort of stitched together and it was great. And the way I designed this was so that none of the leather is actually glued to the bottle. The leather, the leather is glued to itself and stitched to itself, but none of it is actually attached to the bottle itself, which means 
you know, as pieces either get damaged or begin to fail and come off, I can replace them without having to deal with the bottle. And that means if I ever want to take everything off the bottle, which honestly this looks so good, I don't know why I would ever want to do that, um, I can just retain the glass bottle without having any glue residue on it. And so the, the cork up here is just got a string around it. It's a regular wine bottle cork that I carved so that it would fit into the bottle. It gets a little heavy, but you're able to hang it uh, off this leather handle that I made for it via the belt loop. And it's worked like a charm. And so on the bottle, I originally had a leather strip wet formed uh, into this top section here. But the problem that I ran into was that as I was filling it with water, this would get wet and it wouldn't stay in shape and it eventually just completely unraveled itself. And so the way that this is designed is this middle section actually keeps um, the two grip pieces of the handle that I made for it in place so that they don't slide around. And so I replaced that leather strip with a piece of rope to keep everything in place. It stays nice and sturdy. When it gets wet, it doesn't unravel. It actually dries even tighter. So the rope was definitely the way to go for this. And I've even had people come up to me at the fair and be like, that, that's a really cool bottle. Is there a vendor here selling those? And man, it, man, does it feel good to just be like, no, I made it. And it's one of a kind. Right, so in my previous video where I announced that I would be playing Robin Hood at the Robin Hood's Fair in Harlington, Connecticut this summer, I teased that I was trying to make my own bow to use as part of my costume and then also for future videos it just seemed like a, a good idea to become a bowyer. Um, that, that video is going to be delayed for a little bit because I burned through all of the staves that I had making mistakes and I went to tiller it one more time and it's garbage now. Yeah, so I don't, I don't have a bow that I made. I was lent a bow for the fair. Very cool, very cool. I'm sure we, I'm sure we will be seeing that. Someone asked if I would be doing uh, a kit breakdown of my Robin Hood costume. I have to get permission for that. I don't think, I don't feel comfortable just like going and dressing up in, in, in a costume that technically doesn't belong to me for a character that I don't technically own the rights to. So I have to ask permission. Fingers crossed that um, I can do that though, because I love to break down um, what it is that I'm wearing at the fair for you. If you want to see some pictures of me, you can go ahead and follow me on Instagram though. Those will definitely be up there. You can see what it is I look like as Robin of Loxley. But yeah, so in short, the, the bow video is delayed indefinitely because um, I have nothing to show for it. <laughs> some, sometimes we just fail. So thanks for letting me uh, share the products of my mental and physical labor with you guys today. I hope that you found a lot of this stuff cool. Um, and are inspired by the level of self-sufficiency that you're able to attain by identifying a problem in your own life and then being able to solve it with the craft of your own. I, I just genuinely think that's so cool and I'm really glad that I decided to take the leap uh, and get into leatherworking because I've learned so much just not just about leatherworking but just about life outlooks from being able to do this. Um, and now I have uh, now I have these little cool uh, accoutrement that I can add to costumes, you know, at the fair. So I, I wear this as Robin Hood, and Aragorn had one, and, and it might not be like super, you know, realistic, but it's uh, as in I don't know if historically anyone would have ever done this. But sort of the fun thing about being anachronistic is that now I get to add this little piece to my costume. All of all of these things are, are in my costume, aside from the sax knife because it's sharp. But all of these things are, my, are on my costume now. Um, and it just helps bring that little level of, of realism and immersion of like, this isn't just someone in a costume. This, you know, this is someone with, with real, real tools that lives a real life and, and uses these things to survive. And I, I think that's just so great. So if you guys enjoyed the video, if you guys enjoy what it is that I'm trying to do here with anachronistic, um, and medieval reenactments and, and, and experimenting. Go ahead and subscribe, please share the video, and I will see you all next time. Good luck on your adventures.